Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Father and our God, what a privilege it is to be in your presence today. And we ask that as we open your holy book, that your spirit will be here to teach us those things that we need to learn in these last days of human history. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. The title of our study today is The Harvest of the Earth is Ripe. And what we want to do as we begin our study is to give a bird's eye view of the content of Revelation chapter 14. Some of this will be review, but some of it will be new, at least with regards to the sequence of events that we find in this chapter. First of all, in this chapter we find three angels that present their messages to the world. These three messages are the final message of God to planet Earth. We know that these messages are accompanied by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because as we're going to study today, we're going to notice that when these three angels proclaim their messages, the harvest of the earth is ripened and the grapes of the earth are also ripened. Now in ancient Israel, that which ripened the harvest was the latter rain. And of course the latter rep rain represents the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So basically these three angels' messages are accompanied by the power of the Holy Spirit, and this power or this latter rain is going to mature the world into what the Bible calls the harvest and the grapes. Now we also notice that these three angels proclaim a worldwide global message which means that the harvest is a worldwide harvest and the grapes are also a worldwide harvest. Now these three messages basically polarize the world into two groups. One group, the faithful, keep the commandments of God including the fourth commandment or the commandment regarding the Sabbath. The other group break God's commandments and disobey the great Sabbath truth that we find in Scripture. One group receives, according to the Bible, the seal of God, that is those who are obedient to God. And the other group receives the mark of the beast, which we've already studied, means knowingly keeping the first day of the week when very clearly you understand that the Sabbath is the day of rest. And so the Bible tells us that there will be two groups. The way that people respond to these three messages will determine which group they are in. Now in Revelation chapter 14, these two groups are described as the harvest of the earth, that is the righteous, and on the other side are the grapes or the vintage of the earth which represents the wicked. Now it's important to notice that the righteous, according to Revelation 14, as we will study, are gathered inside the city of Jerusalem, whereas the wicked or the grapes are gathered outside the city of Jerusalem. Now there's a very important principle that we need to understand in order to comprehend what we're going to study in our lecture today. And that is that in the book of Revelation, Babylon is not literal Babylon in the Middle East, Babylon is actually a spiritual, symbolic, worldwide system that is inimical to the people of God. On the other sa side, Jerusalem is not a literal city either. Jerusalem represents God's faithful people on a global scale who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus as well as the faith of Jesus. So in other words, Jerusalem is the place where God's people are gathered, but Jerusalem is symbolic or spiritual. Babylon is the place where the wicked are gathered, but Babylon needs to be understood in a spiritual and global or worldwide sense. Now allow me to amplify this principle a little bit as we begin our study because it's going to be foundational for what we study in the rest of the lecture. What I want us to understand now is what I call the law of the literal and the spiritual. 
and I'm going to illustrate it by talking about the garments that were worn by our first parents, Adam and Eve. The Bible tells us that God's garments are garments of light. In fact, the true church in Revelation 12 is represented as a woman who's clothed with the sun. When Jesus was transfigured, the Bible tells us that his garments became white as the light. In other words, Adam and Eve, in their state of innocence and righteousness, were clothed with literal robes of light. But those literal robes of light were symbolic. They represented their righteousness or their obedience to God. So in the Garden of Eden, we have the literal, and we have that which the literal represents. The literal are the garments of light, real light that covered Adam and Eve, and the symbolic, or what that represents, is righteousness or obedience to God. Now we're told in Genesis that when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, they were left literally or physically naked. And the Bible tells us that it was because they were disobedient to God, or now they were unrighteous. In other words, their nakedness, literal nakedness, also represented symbolically spiritual nakedness, unrighteousness, or disobedience to God. So we notice then that originally there was the literal and the spiritual together in the Garden of Eden. A literal robe of light which represented spiritual righteousness. Then when man sinned, man was led, left literally naked, and the Bible tells us that that represented the fact that man was now unrighteous. Now the Bible tells us that God is going to resolve this problem of nakedness in two ways. You see, he has to resolve the problem of spiritual nakedness as well as literal nakedness. Now the Bible tells us that the first thing that God fixes or repairs is by covering us with the spiritual robe of Christ's righteousness. In other words, it's the symbolic robe of Christ's righteousness. Notice Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26. Galatians 3 and verse 26, and we'll also read verse 27. It says here, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, notice, have put on Christ. Obviously, we have not literally put on Christ. We don't have a literal robe of light. We have the spiritual robe, which represents the righteousness of Jesus Christ, symbolically speaking. However, God needs to restore man someday to the fullness of what he was in in the Garden of Eden. And by the way, when I say man, I'm talking generically. It includes man and woman. But God has to restore not only the spiritual robe of Christ's righteousness by covering us spiritually, but someday the Bible tells us that he's also going to give us once again that literal robe of light. But that literal robe comes in the future. I want you to notice Revelation 7, 9 and 10, where it speaks about this moment. It says there, After these things I looked, and behold a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Now notice this, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. Notice that at this point, God's people are in heaven with Jesus. And the Bible tells us that they are clothed with white robes. Now these are literal white robes of light. So basically what Jesus does is now, in this period of human history, he covers us with the spiritual robes of Christ's righteousness. And of course, when Jesus comes again, he is going to give us in an immortal body, and he is going to cover us with a literal robe of light, like the robe of light that covered Adam and Eve. This is the principle that we need to remember as we study our passage today, which is Revelation 14 and verses 14 through 20. You say, how does this relate to the subject that we're studying? Well, the fact is that when the Bible speaks about Jerusalem in prophecy, we are first of all 
inside spiritual Jerusalem before Jesus takes us to the literal Jerusalem when He comes again. In other words, we are spiritually in Jerusalem even though we live in different places of the earth, and someday, if we're faithful, Jesus will take us to be literally in Jerusalem. Allow me to read you some verses that show this very important principle. Hebrews 12, verses 22 to 24. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. And I want you to notice the tense of the verb. But you, speaking about God's faithful people, but you have come to Mount Zion. He's saying in the times when he wrote to the Hebrews, you have come. In other words, they were already there. It says, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. Now which Jerusalem is this? The heavenly Jerusalem to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. Notice that the key is that God's people are not literally in heaven in the new Jerusalem. They are written in heaven. In other words, they are citizens of heaven. So it says in verse 23, to the general assembly in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. So here the author of Hebrews is telling us that we have come to Zion, we have come to the heavenly Jerusalem, we are actually spiritually reckoned in the heavenly Jerusalem, even though we live in different parts of the world. I want you to notice also Galatians chapter 4 and verse 26. Here the Apostle Paul explicitly tells us that Christians are citizens of the new Jerusalem. This is what he says. But the Jerusalem above, that is the new one, is free, which is the mother of us all. Notice also Philippians chapter 3 and verses 20 and 21. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. It says there, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to His glorious body, according to the working by which He is able to subdue all things to Himself. So notice here that the Apostle Paul tells us in his letter to the Philippians that our citizenship is in heaven. Basically, I'm a U.S. citizen. When I travel to Colombia, or when I travel to Venezuela, or when I travel to England or some other country in the world, I can say that really my country of origin, my country where my citizenship is, is the United States. And so is with our spiritual citizenship. We can live anywhere in the world, but our name and our citizenship is in the New Jerusalem in heaven. So when Revelation speaks about God's people being in Jerusalem and the grapes or the wicked being gathered outside Jerusalem, it's not talking about the wicked gathering over next to the literal city of Jerusalem to attack that literal city in the Middle East. What it's saying is that global Babylon, represented by the wine press, is going to gather around God's people who are spiritually in Jerusalem all over the world, and this is going to be the final battle. In fact, we're going to notice that the wicked will gather around God's people all over the world with the intention of destroying them. But of course we know that when Jesus comes, then Jesus is going to take all the citizens of the New Jerusalem up to the New Jerusalem, and then after the thousand years, we will live in the city of Jerusalem, and it will be the capital of the universe. Now, I'd like us to go to Revelation 14, verses 14 through 16, where we have the first harvest mentioned. This first harvest is called the harvest of the earth. And basically, it represents the righteous. And we've already studied that the separation of this harvest from the grapes takes place before Jesus comes in the judgment. In other words, there is an investigative pre-advent judgment in heaven where by the response that people give to the three angels' messages, God separates people into the group of the righteous and into the group of the wicked before the second coming of Jesus Christ. 
And so the verses that we're going to take a look at now, Revelation 14 verses 14 through 16, deals with the separation of the righteous. It says there in verse 14, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man. I want you to remember this. The Son of Man is seated on a cloud. And then it says that he has in his, on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. So the Son of Man comes on the cloud and he is coming as we'll notice, to his father, to the Ancient of Days, and he has a sickle in his hand, and of course, a sickle has the purpose of harvesting. And then notice verse 15, actually, let's look at verse 15. It says, And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap. And as we've already noticed, the reaping or the separation takes place before the second coming of Jesus. Because when Jesus comes, he comes to reward his people. So before that, he must have determined in a heavenly judgment who his people are. And so this angel says to the one who is seated on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap. For the time has come for you to reap, and now listen to this, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. I want you to remember that. It says the harvest of the earth is ripe. Because a little bit later on, we're going to go to the Old Testament background to this passage in Revelation chapter 14. And we're going to notice that it doesn't say the earth, it says something differently. And so it says, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Verse 16, so he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, there it is again, and the earth was reaped. Now there's no doubt whatsoever that this group of individuals who are harvested or who are separated in the judgment before the second coming of Jesus are the righteous. And you'll notice that the separation takes place all over the earth and they're gathered in the city of Jerusalem. We'll notice a little bit later on, but they're not literally gathered there. They are spiritually or symbolically gathered there because they're citizens of the New Jerusalem, and yet they are found all over the world in different countries. And so basically, this first group are those who keep the commandments of God, those who have the seal of God, those who, because they love Jesus, keep the seventh-day Sabbath, and these are the ones who actually will be on God's side in this final conflict or this final controversy. By the way, the book of Daniel also refers to this judgment of the Son of Man coming seated on a cloud uh, to do a work of judgment. And of course, the sickle represents the work of judgment. Let's read Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Here Daniel, inspired by the Holy Spirit, said, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, listen to this, one like the Son of Man, the very same name that we found in Revelation 14, coming with the clouds. See, there it is. He's coming with the clouds of heaven. And I want you to notice that he's not coming to the earth. He's not coming to this world. He's going somewhere else. It says, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came, notice carefully, to the ancient of days. In other words, he came to his father in heaven. And they brought him near before him. They brought Jesus on the cloud near the father. And I want you to notice that he goes there for a work of separation to establish who the members of his kingdom are. Because it says in verse 14, then to him, that is to Jesus, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. And if you read a little bit later on in Daniel chapter 7, it says that when Jesus takes over the kingdom, it says the saints 
took over the kingdom when Jesus came. The time came when the saints received the kingdom. And so basically, what Jesus does, He goes to His Father in heaven, seated on the cloud, and of course the cloud represents the angels. He's going to perform a work of judgment. He's going to separate His people. He's going to show who are the citizens of His kingdom. And then when He finishes that work, we will have the group of those who keep the commandments of God, those who have the seal of God, which are represented as the harvest of the earth, and they're symbolically portrayed as being in the city of Jerusalem. But there is another group which are referred to as the grapes, and those are symbolically portrayed as being outside the city. They are the ones who receive the mark of the beast. They're called the grapes in Scripture. They are the ones who rejected the commandments of God, those who refused the seal of God, those who preferred to keep the day of rest that was changed by the Roman Catholic papacy, as we've studied. Now let's read about this group in Revelation 14 and verses 17 through 20. This is the other harvest. This is the harvest of the wicked, or the separation of the wicked. It says there in verse 17, Then another angel came out of the temple. And I don't really have time to show you that that word temple, the Greek word naos, is really referring to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. It's not talking about all of the heavenly sanctuary. It's talking about the most holy place of the sanctuary. So it says, Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. This is very clearly happening in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. See, he's also going to harvest. And it continues saying, And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire. Now, this altar is the altar of incense, which was in the holy place of the sanctuary. And basically what the priest did was that he would put fire into a censer, and he would also put incense into it. And the Bible says that as he was waving the censer before the Lord, uh, he... He was interceding before God. He was pray presenting the prayers of the saints before God. That is the fire that is spoken of. That is the fire uh, and the altar that is being spoken about here in Revelation chapter 14 and verse uh, 18. But I want you to notice that something is going to happen with that fire in the censer. There's a time coming when the censer is not going to intercede anymore. It's actually going to be thrown to the ground and fire will come out of it, fire to destroy. It says in verse 18, once again, And another angel came out from the altar, who had power over fire. And he cried with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle, and now notice, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth. Notice once again that the harvest is not over in the Middle East. It's not in a little valley next to Jerusalem. It says here, that he is supposed to thrust in his sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth. And then notice it says, for her grapes are fully ripe. In other words, this means that the wicked are fully wicked. They, they wouldn't ever become righteous if God gave them another million years. They are fully and totally and completely wicked. And so now comes the harvest of the wicked who are represented as absolutely ripe grapes, and the Bible tells us that they are gathered all over the earth because the clusters of the vine are on the earth. Notice verse 19. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth. See, there it is again. It's universal. It's worldwide. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth. There it is again. Gathered the vine of the earth, and now notice, and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Now this directly connects with the third angel's message, because the third angel's message says that whoever worships the beast, which we've already identified as the Roman Catholic papacy, as a system, and whoever worships his image, which basically is when the United States of America joins church and state and sets up a system similar to the one that the papacy had during the Middle Ages. And whoever receives his mark, 
The mark of the beast we've already studied carefully from the Bible represents the counterfeit day of worship. Whoever worships the beast, his image, or receives his mark, it says, the same shall drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. So in other words, we find here the moment when the wicked have already made their decisions, they've already rejected the seal of God, they've accepted the mark of the beast, and now they're harvested as grapes, and the punishment of God is going to fall upon them. And so it says that he threw it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. Now, we need to understand that this entire passage of Revelation chapter 14, verses 14 through 20, actually comes from an Old Testament passage in the book of Joel. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to go with me to the book of Joel, chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 9 through 12. Now, tell me what, l let me tell you what the picture is here. The picture here is of God's people gathered in the city of Jerusalem. And the wicked nations that surround Jerusalem are coming to the valley of Jehoshaphat, which was just outside the city of Jerusalem, and they're coming there with the intention of slaying those who are found within the city. But then we're told that God will intervene, and He will pour out His wrath upon the wicked, and He will deliver His people. That's the context of what we find in Joel chapter 3. So let's begin reading at verse 9. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Notice that the nations are coming for war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble and come, all you nations, and gather together all around. And I want you to notice then that the wicked are all gathering around the city of Jerusalem. But notice that the wicked are not the only ones who are gathered there, because it continues saying in verse 11, speaking about God, cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. And so we have two uh, groups of, uh, that are fighting in this war. You have the nations that are coming against Jerusalem, and you have the mighty ones of God that are coming there as well. Notice verse 12. Let the nations be wakened. Come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, which as I mentioned is a valley outside the city of Jerusalem. And then notice, for there I will sit to judge all the nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Now you'll notice that in the Old Testament, when God was dealing with literal Israel, you're talking about the literal city of Jerusalem, and you're talking about the literal valley of Jehoshaphat. But when you come to the book of Revelation, the valley of Jehoshaphat is universalized or globalized because we're told there that it includes the whole earth. We already read it. And Jerusalem no longer is the little Jerusalem in the Middle East. Jerusalem is God's worldwide people that are gathered every place on planet earth. And the Bible says that there are going to be two groups. There's going to be God's faithful people who have the seal of God gathered spiritually in Jerusalem, but all over the world. And then you're going to have Babylon, those who have the mark of the beast. They're also gathered surrounding God's people all over the world with the intention of destroying them. By the way, you remember in Revelation chapter 13, it says that those who do not worship the beast or receive the mark, First of all, they would be forbidden from buying and selling. And then in Revelation 13, verse 15, it says that whoever does not receive the mark of the beast should be killed. In other words, the powers of the earth, the nations of the earth are going to gather against God's people who keep the commandments of God, who have the seal of God, and who are faithful to the Lord. 
and God's people are gathered spiritually in Jerusalem, the wicked are gathered spiritually in Babylon. You know, I find it very interesting that many commentators on Bible prophecy say that Babylon at the end of time is not really literal Babylon. Babylon represents uh, Rome or spiritual Rome or the papacy, which is global worldwide system. But they're not consistent. They don't follow up on that. Because if Babylon is worldwide or global, then Jerusalem, which Babylon comes against, must also be global and worldwide. You can't have it both ways. They're either literal, both of them, or they're spiritual, both of them. And then notice verse 14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And now notice what's going to happen in that day. The sun and moon will grow dark, and the stars will diminish their brightness. These are signs when Jesus comes, according to Matthew chapter 24. The Lord also will roar from Zion, and utter His voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and earth will shake, but the Lord, notice this, will be a shelter for His people and the strength of the children of Israel. Why would God need to be the shelter for His people and the strength for the children of Israel? Because according to this passage and Revelation 14, the wicked who have the mark of the beast, who follow the beast, who worship His image, are coming against God's people to destroy them all over the world. Notice verse 17, So you shall know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then Jerusalem shall be holy, and no aliens shall ever pass through her again. The expression pass through her means attack her and try to destroy her and pillage her. Verse 18, And it will come to pass in that day, that, and, and this is speaking about once Jesus comes, once you have the new heavens and the new earth, it says, And it will come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drip with new wine, the hills shall flow with milk, and all the brooks of Judah shall be flooded with water. A fountain shall flow from the house of the Lord and water the valley of the Acacias. Egypt shall be a desolation. These are enemies of God's people. And Edom, a desolate wilderness. Because, now notice why God is going to cause this for the enemies of God's people. It says, because of the violence against the people of Judah. For they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah, that is God's faithful people, shall abide forever. And Jerusalem from generation to generation. So this is the picture that we find in Revelation 14. Revelation 14 is talking about three angels' messages that go to the world. These three messages are accompanied by the power of God's Holy Spirit. This powerful message, which is composed of three consecutive parts, divides the world into two groups, the righteous and the wicked. And Jesus in heaven separates these two groups in a heavenly judgment. And then the door of probation closes. The Bible tells us that the wicked gather around Jerusalem, that is, around God's people all over the world, symbolic Jerusalem, because they're citizens of the new Jerusalem. And they will have the intention of destroying God's people. But the Bible says that God will protect His people, and He will pour out His wrath upon those who want to destroy them. Now you'll notice in Revelation 14 and verse 20 that the wine press is located outside the city. In other words, you have two groups. The righteous are inside the city, and the wicked are outside the city. Those who have the seal of God are inside. Those who have the mark of the beast are outside. Let's read that verse, Revelation 14 and verse 20. And the winepress, which is where the wrath of God is poured out, was trampled outside the city. Notice that the wicked never destroy those who are with God in the city, spiritually with God all over the world. It says, and the winepress was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress. These, these are not literal grapes. Your grape juice looks like blood, and so you're using a symbol here. It says, and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. You say, now wait a minute. What language is that? Suddenly you have here that outside the holy city, horses are coming, and the horses are trampling the winepress, which represents the wicked, 
and the blood flows for 1,600 furlongs. The question is, which is this city, and who is riding on these white horses? Well, the fact is that we have to go to the book of Revelation to answer these two questions. Which is this city, and who is sitting on this white horse, and who are sitting on white horses that trample upon the wicked or destroy the wicked, so to speak? Let's go to Revelation chapter 19 and verses 11 through 21. You find here a context of war. On one side you have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And they are arrayed to fight against Jesus who is coming with the heavenly host from heaven. So you have a battle here of Christ and His angels against the powers that are mentioned in the third angel's message. Notice Revelation 19, verse 11. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. So notice the one who is seated on the white horse comes to make war. Why would he come to make war? Folks, it's simply because these powers, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, want to destroy God's people. The Bible tells us that the dragon is enraged with the woman, and he goes to make war against the remnant of her seed because they keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The third angel says, here is the patience of the saints, here are they who keep the commandments of God, and the faith of Jesus. And then immediately you have this scene of Revelation 14, verses 14 through 20. So the final battle has to do with God's commandments. It has to do with worship. It has to do with whether you are obedient to God or disobedient to God. Notice verse 12. This individual on the horse is identified. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. The word diademata, which is the crown of a king. And it says he had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. We'll come back to that in a few moments. So the one who's on the white horse comes with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Very clearly, Jesus Christ. Verse 14, and the armies in heaven, see, he doesn't come by himself. He comes with other beings, with the angels on white horses. So it says, and the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now we know who's sitting on the horses that trample the, trample the wine press. It's Jesus Christ and His angels who are coming to rescue God's people because the nations of the earth are about to annihilate them. Now, you, I'm not speculating. Notice verse 15. Now, out of His mouth, that is, of the one who is seated on the white horse, goes a sharp sword, which is symbolic of His word, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. And now notice this. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So the one on the white horse and those who accompany him on white horses are coming to do what? They are coming to trample on the winepress. This in Revelation 19 is an explanation of Revelation 14 and verse 20, where it speaks about the horses trampling the winepress outside the city and blood coming out of the winepress. It's a symbolic portrayal of Jesus coming to destroy the wicked because they want to destroy His people who are in a covenant relationship with Him. And then notice verse 16. And he has, the one on the white horse, Jesus, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And now notice who he's, who he's coming to fight against. It says, And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies, and a little bit later we're going to see that the false prophet is there too. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies, these are the same powers that are mentioned in the third angel's message, gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against 
His army. So this war is between Christ and His angels, and the wicked and the armies of the earth. And then it says in verse 20, Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, see there's the powers that are mentioned in the third angel's message, who works signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast, and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. That's in the third angel's message too. It says whoever receives the mark of the beast and worships the beast will be punished with fire and brimstone, the wrath of God. So we know that this scene is connected with the third angel's message. Verse 21, and the rest, that is the remnant, those who are still left after the initial coming of Jesus, it says, And the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. That is, when Jesus actually arrives on planet earth, there's only a remnant to destroy, because before this, the plagues have decimated and destroyed many of the people on planet earth. And when Jesus comes, there's only a remnant left to be destroyed. Now you'll notice that uh, the Bible portrays Jesus symbolically as being clothed with a robe dipped in blood, in other words, with a red robe. Now this is not saying that when Jesus comes, He's going to come with His blood to save people, although it's true that He's going to save His people from annihilation. The Bible explains that the reason why Jesus is clothed in red garments is because Jesus is coming to trample upon the wine press. Now I don't know if you know what a wine press is, but basically uh, in some places in Italy they still do it the old way. They put the ripe grapes in a great big uh, pool-like structure, you might say, and then they get inside and they start stepping on the grapes to make the wine, and that's the wine press. And by the way, the Bible says that sometimes they sang songs as they were trampling on the grapes. And of course, as they trampled on the grapes, the, the grapes splattered and their clothing got red because they were trampling upon the grapes. This is the image. The image is that Jesus is coming to destroy those who would destroy His people. It says in Isaiah 63, where this uh, imagery comes from, verses 1 through 4, Who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength? Here comes the answer. I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. So who is this that is coming uh, according to this from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? who is glorious in his apparel, it says, uh, God answers, I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. And then the question is asked, why is your apparel red? That is, why is your clothing red? And your garments like one who treads the winepress. See, there it is. His garments are red because he treads the winepress. And then he explains why. I have trodden the winepress alone because Jesus came and he suffered the wrath of God. He drank the cup of God's wrath. He did it for everyone on planet earth. But if you refuse to accept Jesus Christ who drank the cup of God's wrath in your place, then we must drink the, uh, the wrath of God, the wine of the wrath of God ourselves. And Jesus doesn't want anyone to go through that. He wants everyone to repent and to come to Jesus that they might experience salvation. And so it says in verse 3, I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me, because Jesus suffered basically by himself. And then it says, For I have trodden them in my anger, and trampled them in my fury. This is talking about what's going to happen in the future. Not literally, but symbolically. It's talking about the destruction of the wicked. And it says, Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. So notice that he's coming to save his redeemed. Now some people say, well, Pastor Bohr, this is kind of a gory description. You mean Jesus is going to come to destroy the wicked? Uh, how can a loving Jesus destroy the wicked? Let me explain uh, so that you can understand a little bit better. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. In other words, Jesus came to this world 
to suffer for every single sin that has ever been committed on planet earth. Basically on the cross Jesus paid the penalty for every sin that has been committed, is being committed, and will be committed in the future. And so you say, wait, well, then everyone is going to be saved. No, because the same verse says that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In other words, we must claim what Jesus did for us. We must claim the gift that he paid for, and if we don't, we will perish. It says there in John 3, 16, not only that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, uh, but it also says that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, folks, what's going to happen at the end of time, according to the description of Revelation, is that the wicked who are gathered all over the world, who have the mark of the beast, in other words, they've chosen to be disobedient to God's commandments, particularly the fourth commandment that says that we're supposed to keep the Sabbath as God's day of rest, the Bible says that they are going to gather in the wine press, which symbolically represents the place where, God's, where the wicked are gathering against God's people, and this will be on a global scale. They will be gathered against those who have the seal of God, against those who keep the commandments of God, who are faithful to God, who keep His holy Sabbath even in the face of death. Now, what would you expect? Would you expect Jesus Christ to simply allow the wicked to destroy his people and to blot them out from the earth? Or do you suppose that if his people have, have formed a covenant with Jesus, if they've received Jesus, if they're faithful to him, they keep his commandments, do you think that God, in order to be faithful to his covenant, would have to intervene and destroy those who want to destroy them so that he could save them? Of course. Jesus gave those who want to destroy his people the opportunity to be saved. But they rejected the opportunity. The issues became very clear. The seal of God was clearly understood to represent the observance of God's holy Sabbath. The mark of the beast was clearly understood as observing the day that was changed by the Roman Catholic papacy. The issues were clear to everyone on planet earth. And yet some people in the fullness of light chose to continue keeping the day of rest that God did not establish from the very beginning. And so basically Jesus has to come to this earth to destroy the wicked, because if he doesn't, the wicked will destroy the people of Jesus. I might give you an example. In the Old Testament, the model shepherd, of course, over, besides God, who is the model shepherd, but humanly speaking, the good shepherd in the Old Testament was David. He was conceived to be uh, the, the model shepherd or the ideal shepherd. You know, when a lion or a bear came to uh, kill one of the little lambs of David, what did David do? Well, you know what he did. The Bible says that he would go after the bear, and he would go after the lion, and he would attack the bear and lion, and he would kill them so that they would not kill his little lamb. Do you think that David did right? You know, David could say, well, you know, the, the fight of the lion and the bear is against the lamb. That doesn't have anything to do with me. Let him kill the lamb. That wouldn't be very nice, would it? because the lamb was, Dave, was David's lamb. And in order for the lamb to survive, it was necessary for David to intervene and destroy the lion and the bear that wanted to destroy his little lamb. And so it is at the end of time. God is going to have a people that are his sheep. They are his lambs. They have a, the seal of God on their foreheads. And yet the wicked, like roaring lions, will come and want to destroy the people of Jesus. So Jesus will say, hey, don't you touch my lambs. Don't you destroy my lambs. If you try and destroy them, I am going to become involved in the battle. The Bible says that Jesus is the head and his church is the body. Listen, when the wicked come to attack the body of Jesus, they're really attacking the head. They're attacking Jesus. And Jesus has to intervene to deliver his people because he needs to be faithful to his covenant. His people have formed a covenant relationship with him. Now let's read Jeremiah 25, verses 30 to 38, where we have an additional picture of this winepress symbolism. It says in verse 30, Therefore prophesy against them all these words, and say to them, 
the Lord will roar from, uh, from on high and utter His voice from His holy habitation. He will roar mightily against His fold. He will give a shout. Do you remember that when Jesus comes in 1 Thessalonians 4, He will give a shout. He will speak with the voice of the archangel. So it says, He will roar mightily against His fold. He will give a shout as those, notice this, as those who tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. A noise will come to the ends of the earth, for the Lord has a controversy with the nations. He will plead His case with all flesh. He will give those who are wicked to the sword, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, disaster shall go forth from one nation to another nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the farthest parts of the earth. And at that day the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall become refuse on the ground. And there's a special group that God has a controversy with. Notice what we find uh, in verse 34. Wail, shepherds, and cry. Roll about in the ashes, you leaders of the flock. It's talking about the leaders of Israel, the, the ministers of Israel. For the days of your slaughter and your dispersions are fulfilled. You shall fall like a precious vessel. And the shepherds will have no way to flee, nor the leaders of the flock to escape. Notice that God's controversy is against those who did not protect their sheep, those who perhaps even deceived their sheep, those who told their sheep that the law was nailed to the cross, that it's not necessary for Christians to keep the Sabbath because it was for the Jews. It says in verse 36, a voice of the cry of the shepherds and a wailing of the leaders to the flock will be heard. For the Lord has plundered their pasture and the peaceful dwellings are cut down because of the fierce anger of the Lord. He has left his lair like the lion for their land is desolate because of the fierceness of the oppressor and because of his fierce anger. These are vivid pictures of the destruction of the wicked who want to destroy God's people who have formed a covenant relationship with God. Now we need to deal with one final thing before we bring this to an end. What about the 1,600 stadia? Now allow me to read you, first of all, a statement. This is not from the Bible. It's from the Apocrypha. But it shows that the imagery of horses treading a wine press and uh, wading in blood is a common symbol that was used back in that time. It says in 1st Enoch chapter 100 and verse 3, by the way this isn't inspired, I'm just showing you that this kind of conception existed in, in uh, the times that John wrote. It says, the horse, horse shall walk through the blood of sinners up to his chest. See that's very similar to Revelation 14. And the chariot shall sink down up to its top in those days the angels, see that's the angels that are doing this, in those days the angels shall descend into the secret places. They shall gather together into one place all those who gave aid to sin, and we know that that's the winepress, and the Most High will arise on that day of judgment in order to execute a great judgment upon all the sinners. So you have this imagery already contained in these books from the time in which John wrote. Now what about the 1,600 stadia? The fact is that the Bible, uh, in the book of Revelation specifically, intensifies numbers to represent that these numbers are not literal, but they express something much greater, something which is universal. Now 1,600 is 4 times 4 times 100. Now number four is the number of universality, the four angles of the earth. But what John is doing, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is intensifying the number four. He's multiplying four times four times 100 to express the fact that the wine press covers the whole earth. In fact, the Bible does this also with the 144,000. The 144,000 is 12 
times 12 times 1,000. In other words, it represents a much larger group, or group than literally 144,000 people. So basically, this 1,600 stadia is a multiple of four intensified, which represents the fact that the wicked will be found globally in the winepress of the world surrounding God's faithful people that are in spiritual Jerusalem on a global or worldwide scale. Now, there's an interesting commentary made by Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown. This is a very well-known uh, Bible commentary. It's not uh, written by Seventh-day Adventists, but they grasped this idea that 1600 represents something that happens on a worldwide scale. They say in their commentary this, 1,600, a square number, 4 by 4 by 100. The four quarters, they explain, north, south, east, and west of the Holy Land, or else of the world, the universality of the worldwide destruction being indicated. And so basically they're saying that 1,600 stadia represents an intensified number four, symbolizing the fact that this is going to take place on a global or worldwide scale. So it's not necessary for us to look over to the literal Middle East for the fulfillment of these prophecies. The final issue is not Jews against the Russians and the Arabs or the Palestinians. The final issue does not have to do with the oil of the Middle East. The final issues are not of a political nature. The final issues are whether you have the seal of God or the mark of the beast, whether you are obedient to the commandments of God or whether you are disobedient, whether you worship God on His holy day or whether you worship on the day that the beast has established as a counterfeit day of worship. In other words, the final issues will not be material or financial or economic. They will have to do with deep spiritual issues. Who do you obey? Who do you worship will determine on which side you are. And I pray that as we come to an end of this study, this fascinating study from Revelation chapter 14, verses 14 through 20, that all of us will make the decision to worship God, to obey the commandments of God, to keep His holy Sabbath, not because we have to, not because we're forced to, not in order to earn salvation, but because we love Jesus, and because we love Him, we want to obey Him.